Data from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations shows that the global food price index rose by 0.9% to 120.4 points in May this year. That's from its revised April levels. Driven by increases in the price indices for cereals and dairy products, Kola Masha, CEO of Babanguna, joins me for this discussion and how it impacts Nigeria's food price index. Kola, thank you for taking the time out to join us today. My pleasure, my pleasure. Just to get your uh, quick thoughts or takeaways from the FAO's uh, food uh, price index for the month of May. I mean, what were the key highlights for you? Well, I think, you know, fundamentally, uh, we have seen broadly uh, that, uh, you know, uh, prices seem to be uh, stabilizing. I think we saw a huge spike uh, with a lot of uh, rapid inflation uh, back uh, triggered, I think, mostly by the Ukraine war. Um, however, I think we are seeing some normalization uh, as uh, countries uh, and supply has uh, moderate, has improved and uh, things have started to stabilize. So uh, it's uh, positive. Right. Yeah, over uh, the last, I think, certainly over the last uh, few months. Okay, right. We'll continue to monitor the index, but I wanted us to uh, talk about some recent developments uh, back here uh, in Nigeria and the agriculture space. Uh, key among them uh, is uh, the plan by the federal government to uh, import or suspend import levies on some staple food items, including uh, rice paddy and maize seeds. Just wanted to get your initial thoughts on that, and to what extent do you see this uh, achieving the targets of bringing down inflation? Well, I think, you know, the reality is uh, some of these are uh, important short-term measures uh, that the government is taking. But reality, uh, at the end of the day, uh, easing imports and making it easier to import is really not going to solve our challenge uh, in the medium to long term. Uh, at the end of the day, the only thing that's going to solve our challenge in the medium to long term is a, is a really strong focus on improving productivity at the farm level. Uh, and to accomplish that, uh, it really is one key lever uh, that needs to uh, be executed, and that is increasing access to finance um, by smallholder farmers to be able to uh, purchase the quantity and quality of inputs they need to get uh, the uh, the yields that are required uh, to really become self-sufficient. Uh, well, well, I do do apologize yeah, for, but sorry. why do you think that this is still an issue? Uh, because you and I have had this conversation several times, and you always point to finance as you know, that key to unlocking uh, more productivity on the farms. Is it uh, high risk for the banks? Or I know the bank of industry. I know that there's an agriculture bank. This, uh, there appear to be a couple of avenues for these farmers to access finance. So what appears to be the problem? Well, I think, you know, fundamentally, um, what you tend to see in uh, most uh, markets is that the government plays a role uh, to de-risk access to finance and crowd in uh, capital. Um, so they provide uh, typically uh, some form of guarantees to the private sector um, that uh, catalyzes in uh, capital from the private sector to finance agriculture. I think fundamentally, if you look at, you know, agriculture and really if you look at both the in inputs to agriculture as well as the outputs from the agriculture sector, those together contribute to about 40% of GDP. Uh, production itself is between 25 and 30% of GDP. However, in terms of percentage of uh, lending uh, to the sector, we're talking about you know between 3 and 5%, depending on what data you look at. So it's woefully underfinanced uh, as it's uh, in terms of its percentage contributions to GDP. And I think you know there needs to be a concerted effort uh, by government to, as opposed to launching programs that tries to utilize its own balance sheet to solve the problem. Um, figuring out how to uh, use uh, guarantee programs in an effective way to catalyze in capital to the sector. Right, but the, appear, uh, the perception appears to be insecurity. That's what we see in the dailies, you know, from time to time. The farmers are unable to go to their farms because uh, they're afraid of bandits, terrorists, etc. cetera. Uh, we hear, I mean, that, that just appears to be what we see most of the time. And that, I, I believe, has shaped perception when it comes to uh, levels of productivity and the amount of food that we are producing. What we hear is that 
in the food producing parts of, of uh, the country, many farmers have abandoned their farms, many are probably even in IDP, cam IDP camps, etc. To what extent, I mean, when you look at the, the, the bigger picture, yes, you've mentioned finance is number one. How big a problem is what I've just mentioned when you weigh it against the issue of finance? Well, I think, you know, uh, as, uh, as you know, an organization, we've been farming in Nigeria now going on uh, nearly a decade and a half, uh, supporting, you know, cumulatively close to 400,000 smallholder farmers. Um, so insecurity is a key risk. Um, but I do suspect that uh, in certain pockets of the country, um, it has become uh, insecurity levels have grown uh, to the point where farmers are challenged. Uh, but I'm not sure it's quite as widespread as uh, what might be uh, outlined. I think fundamentally, uh, farmers, you know, millions of small farmers across Nigeria are waking up every day, going out to their farms and trying to uh, make a living. Um, and I think, you know, the, the at the end of the day, the critical thing that's going to enable them to be more productive is access to finance to be able to buy the quantity and quality of uh, of inputs that they need to get those high yields. So uh, let, let's speak hypothetically. If this situation doesn't improve, if uh, finance, uh, that finance gap continues to widen and not be addressed, what can we expect? Because what the government is doing is saying, we're going to import food. We expect that perhaps in the short term, maybe short to medium term, we expect that you know, the absence of these levies on some staple crops or goods or food items will crash inflation. We'll have more food in the country. Give us, buy us some time to increase productivity uh, in the short to medium term also. But I mean, what do you foresee? Well, I think, you know, to be frank, traditionally, uh, what governments have done uh, is actually the opposite, right? Governments usually what they do is actually protect their domestic industry um, to create the right incentive structures to increase productivity. And as they increase productivity, that eventually what will drive down uh, inflation, right? If you look at, you know, country after country after country, that's, that's more of the playbook. Because fundamentally, if you are making it easier to import, you're actually... Uh, disincentivizing domestic production, right? Because you're uh, creating uh, 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 more competition uh, that may, you know, have products that are potentially subsidized or or have other uh, incentives in their home country that are actually make it difficult for farmers to compete. Um, so usually it's the other way around. You know, if you look at take the poultry sector as a key example. You know, poultry sector had very strong protection uh, starting in uh, the early 2000s. That enabled the sector to grow dramatically, create, I think, cumulatively, uh, if you look at entire value chain, close to 12 million jobs in Nigeria, um, and has gotten to a point where it's relatively productive compared to other markets. Um, it usually takes time, um, but that's, uh, that's a more traditional approach. All right, uh, uh, Kola, we'll have to leave it there. We'll talk, thank you for talking to us today. We appreciate your insight uh, on this uh, issue. Uh, Kola Masha, CEO of Babangona.